55 year history of the CCP was written with blood and lies. In order to maintain absolute domination, the CCP, which is possessed by an evil specter, has created terror by ceaselessly killing. During its more than 50 year rule, the CCP has persecuted more than half the people in China. An estimated 60 to 80 million people have died from unnatural causes. This number exceeds the total number of deaths in both world wars combined and also exceeds the total number of unnatural deaths in every dynasty since the beginning of Chinese history. Behind the CCP slaughters lie a supporting ideology and some practical requirements. Ideologically, the CCP believes in the dictatorship of the proletariat and continuous revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Therefore, after the CCP took over in China, it killed the landowners to resolve problems with production relationships in rural areas. It killed the capitalists to reach the goal of commercial and industrial reform and to solve the issue of so-called production relationships in the cities. Similarly, solving the problems related to the superstructure also called for slaughter. The suppressions of the Hu Feng anti-party group and the anti-rightists movement eliminated the intellectuals. The mass murders during the Cultural Revolution established the CCP's absolute leadership. The 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre was used to prevent political crisis and to squelch demands for democracy. The persecution of Falun Gong is meant to resolve the problem of having people with traditional beliefs and who practice Qigong. These actions were all necessary for the CCP to strengthen its power and maintain its rule in the face of continual financial crisis, political crisis, and crisis of belief. Except for the Falun Gong issue, almost all the foregoing political movements were utilized to revive the evil specter of the CCP and incite its desire for revolution. The CCP also used these political movements to test CCP members, eliminating those who did not meet the party's requirements. Killing was also necessary for practical reasons. The Communist Party began as a group of thugs and scoundrels who killed to obtain power. Once this precedent was set, there was no going back. Constant terror was needed to intimidate people and force them to accept, out of fear, the absolute rule of the CCP. On the surface, it may appear that the CCP was forced to kill and that various incidents just happened to irritate the CCP evil specter and accidentally trigger the CCP killing mechanism. In truth, these incidents serve to disguise the party's need to kill. Periodic killing is required by the CCP. Without these painful lessons, people might begin to think the CCP was improving and start to demand democracy, just as the idealistic students in the 1989 democracy movement did. Recurring slaughter every seven or eight years serves to refresh people's memory of terror and to warn the younger generation that whoever works against the CCP, whoever wants to challenge the CCP's absolute leadership, or whoever attempts to tell the truth about Chinese history, anyone who does these things will get a taste of the iron fist of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Killing has become one of the most essential ways for the CCP to maintain power. With the escalation of its bloody debts, Laying down its butcher knife would encourage people to take vengeance for the party's criminal acts. Therefore, the CCP not only needed to conduct widespread and thorough killing, but the slaughter also had to be done in a most brutal fashion to effectively intimidate the populace, especially early on when the CCP was establishing its rule. Since the purpose of the killing was to instill great terror, the CCP selected targets for destruction arbitrarily and irrationally. And in each of these so-called political movements, the CCP used the strategy of genocide. And the slaughter still continues today. The stories behind the slaughter are both extremely tragic and rarely seen. As a result, 
In addition to the destruction of countless individuals and families, the CCP has destroyed the soul of the Chinese people. A great many people have become conditioned to react to the CCP's threats by entirely surrendering their reason and their principles. In a sense, these people's souls have died. Something more frightening even than physical death. In past dynasties, the emperors granted amnesty to the entire country after they were crowned. On the other hand, before Mao Zedong established the PRC, he wrote the following, We definitely do not apply a policy of benevolence toward reactionaries and the reactionary activities of the reactionary classes. Before the CCP was in power, it had already made up its mind to act tyrannically. It called itself the People's Democratic Dictatorship. In March 1950, the CCP announced orders to strictly suppress reactionary elements. It must be pointed out that the CCP did not suppress reactionary behaviors, just the people that they labeled as reactionaries. If one had simply enlisted in the KMT army, even without doing the slightest thing political after the CCP gained power, this person would still be killed because of his so-called reactionary history. In February 1951, the central CCP said that except for Zhejiang province and southern Anhui province, other areas which are not killing enough should continue to arrest and kill a large number and should not stop too soon. Mao even recommended the following. In rural areas, there should be more than one in every thousand of the total population killed. In the cities, it should be less than one for every thousand. The population of China at that time was approximately 600 million people. So this supreme order from Mao would have caused at least 600,000 deaths. Perhaps on a whim, Mao decided these 600,000 lives should be enough to lay the foundation for creating fear among the people and thus ordered it to happen. Whether those killed deserved to die was not the CCP's concern. The People's Republic of China Regulations for Punishing the Reactionaries announced in 1951 that even those who spread rumors can be immediately executed. While the suppression of reactionaries was being hotly implemented, land reform was also taking place on a large scale. On the surface, land reform appeared to advocate an ideal all would have land to farm, but in fact it was really just an excuse to kill. Tao Chu, who ranked third in the CCP afterwards, had a slogan for land reform. Every village bleeds, every household fights. He meant that in every village, the landowners must die. Land reform could have been achieved without killing. It could have been done in the same way as the Taiwanese government by purchasing the property from the landowners. However, the CCP only knew how to rob. Fearing it might suffer revenge after robbing, the CCP naturally needed to kill the victims. The most common way to kill was struggle meeting. The CCP fabricated crimes and charged the landowners or rich farmers. The public was asked how they should be punished. Some CCP members or activists were already planted in the crowd, and they would shout, We should kill them! So the landowners and rich peasants were executed on the spot. By the end of 1952, the number of so-called reactionary elements who had been executed was about 2.4 million, according to official CCP publications. The actual death toll of former KMT government officials was over 5 million. During the CCP's land reform, the death toll was about 10 million. During the suppression of the reactionaries and the land reform, the CCP killed all the management personnel from the previous system and realized complete control of rural areas by installing a party branch in every village. A huge amount of wealth was obtained by stealing and robbing during the two campaigns. The third result was that the civilians were all terrorized.
The suppression of reactionaries and the land reform mainly targeted the countryside, while the subsequent three anti and five anti campaign could be regarded as the corresponding genocide in the cities. In the three anti movement, a batch of the CCP's corrupt cadres was executed, while the five anti campaign was essentially murdering the capitalists for their money. The capitalists were required to pay taxes that the CCP accused them of having evaded in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They could not possibly afford to pay these so-called taxes. They had no other choice but jumped from tall buildings, leaving a corpse so that the CCP could see proof of their death. Chen Yi, the mayor of Shanghai at that time, was briefed every night while lounging on his sofa with a cup of tea in hand. He would ask, how many paratroopers were there today? Meaning, how many businessmen jumped out of high buildings to commit suicide today? None of the capitalists could escape the five anti-campaign. It was said that at that time, people didn't dare to walk next to tall buildings in Shanghai in fear of being crushed by people jumping from above. Since the CCP took power, the highest and most miserable death toll was recorded during China's Great Famine from 1959 to 1961. At least 30 million people starved to death. The Great Famine was falsely labeled by the CCP as a three-year natural disaster. In fact, those three years had favorable weather conditions and didn't have any huge natural disasters. The disaster was caused entirely by man. The Great Leap Forward campaign required everyone in China to become involved in steel making, forcing farmers to leave their crops to rot in the fields. Officials in every region escalated their reports of production yields. Rice yields of over 3,000 tons per acre were boasted. Consequently, the grain rations, seeds, and staple foods of the peasants were all confiscated as a form of taxation according to these exaggerated yields. He Yiran, first secretary of the party committee of Liu Zhou Prefecture, said that the Liu Zhou area must strive to get first place in the competition for highest yield no matter how many local people would die as a result. In some areas, the government even issued orders forbidding cooking to thereby prevent the peasants from eating their crops. Many peasants did not even dare to cook the food they found growing in the wild and died of starvation. In the book Historical Records of the People's Republic of China, published in 1994, it states the number of unnatural deaths and reduced births from 1959 to 1961 is estimated at about 40 million. This is likely to be the world's greatest famine in this century. In this report, unnatural deaths and reduced birth population actually represents the number of people starved to death. Historically, in times of famine, the government would provide rice porridge, they would distribute the crops and allow victims to flee from famine-stricken areas. The CCP, however, regarded fleeing from the famine as a disgrace to the party's prestige and ordered militiamen to block roadways to prevent the victims from escaping the famine. When the peasants were so hungry as to snatch grain from grain depots, the CCP ordered shooting at the crowd and labeled those killed as counter-revolutionary elements. A great number of peasants were starved to death in many provinces, including Gansu, Shandong, Henan, Anhui, and Guangxi. The hungry peasants were forced to take part in irrigation work and steel making. Many dropped to the ground while working and never got up again. At the end, those who survived had no strength to bury the dead. Many villages died out completely. In the most serious famines in China's history prior to the CCP, there were cases in which families exchanged one another's children to eat, but nobody ever ate his own children. Under the CCP reign, however, people were driven to eat those who died, cannibalize those who fled from other regions, and even kill and eat their own children. The writer Sha Qing depicted this scene in a book 
an obscure land of Bayou. In a peasant's family, a father was left with only his son and daughter during the Great Famine. One day, the daughter was driven out of the house by her father. When she came back, she could not find her younger brother, but saw white oil floating in the cauldron and a pile of bones next to the stove. Several days later, the father added more water to the pot and called his daughter to come closer. The girl was frightened and pleaded with her father from outside the door. Daddy, please don't eat me. I can collect firewood and cook food for you. If you eat me, nobody else will do this for you. The final extent and number of tragedies like this is unknown. But we do know that the CCP cadres at different levels, the ones directly responsible for these tragedies, had resisted telling the truth in the face of tens of millions starving to death. As a result, they passed the CCP's test. After the Great Famine, the responsible provincial officials merely participated in the formality of self-criticism. Li Jin Chuan, the CCP secretary for Sichuan province, where millions of people died from starvation, was promoted, yet the CCP misrepresented these people as being worthy of noble honor, claiming that the CCP was leading people to bravely fight the natural disasters and continued to tout itself as great, glorious, and correct. Everything the CCP does serves only one purpose, gaining and maintaining power. Killing is a very important way for the CCP to maintain its power. The more people killed and the crueler the killings, the greater the ability to terrify. In his book, The Enemy Within, Father Raymond J. De Jager relates the killing stories he witnessed in North China during the Sino-Japanese War. One day, the CCP required everyone to go to the square in the village. Teachers led the children to the square from school to watch the killing of 13 patriotic young men. After announcing the fabricated charges against the victims, the CCP ordered the horrified teacher to lead the children to sing patriotic songs while gesturing the executioner to begin. The executioner was a fierce, robust young communist soldier with strong arms. The soldier went behind the first victim, quickly raised a big sharp knife and struck downwards, and the first head fell to the ground. Blood sprayed out like a fountain as the head rolled on the ground. The children's hysterical singing turned into chaotic screaming and crying. The teacher kept the beat, trying to keep the songs going. The executioner chopped 13 times and 13 heads fell to the ground. After that, many communist soldiers came over, cut open the victims' chests, and took out their hearts for a feast. All the brutality was done in front of the children. The children went all pale due to the terror, and some started throwing up. The teachers scolded them and lined the children up to return to school. After that, Father de Jaeger often saw children being forced to watch killings. The children became used to the bloody scenes and numb to the killing. Some even started to enjoy the excitement. When the CCP felt that simple killing was not horrifying and exciting enough, they invented all kinds of cruel tortures. For example, forcing someone to swallow a large amount of salt without letting him drink any water. The victim would suffer until he died of thirst. Or stripping someone naked and forcing him to roll on broken glass. Or cutting a hole in the frozen river in the winter and throwing the victim into the hole the victim would either freeze to death or drown. Father de Jaeger's book also told stories like the following one. A CCP member in Shanxi province invented a terrible torture. One day when he was wandering in the city, he stopped in front of a restaurant and stared at a big boiling vat. Later, he purchased several giant vats and immediately arrested some people who were against the Communist Party. During the hasty trial, the vats were filled with water and heated to boiling. The three victims were stripped naked and thrown into the vats to boil to death after the trial. At Pingshan, I witnessed a father being skinned alive. The CCP members forced the son to watch and participate in the inhumane torture. 
To see his father die in excruciating pain and to listen to his father's screams. The CCP members poured vinegar and acid onto the father's body. They started from the back, then up to the shoulders, and soon the skin from his whole body was peeled off, leaving only the skin on the head intact. His father died minutes later. If one were to suggest that these extremely cruel ways of killing appeared only in individual areas in wartime, then such violence became even worse after the CCP took power. During the Red Terror in 1966, all the five black classes, the landlords, rich farmers, reactionaries, bad elements, and rightists, were eradicated according to a policy of genocide across many areas. A typical example was Daxing County near Beijing, where from August 27 to September 1st of 1966, a total of 325 people were killed. The oldest killed was 80 years old, and the youngest only 38 days. 22 entire households were killed with no one left. Yu Lo Wen recorded a narrative in his investigation of the Daxing massacre. Beating a person to death was a common scene. On Shatan Street, a group of male Red Guards tortured an old woman with metal chains and leather belts, and then a female Red Guard jumped on her body and stomped on her stomach. The old woman died on the scene. There were many different ways of killing, including beating with batons, cutting with sickles, and strangling with ropes. The way to kill babies was the most brutal. The killer stepped on one leg and then pulled on the other leg, tearing the baby in half. Besides beating people to death, the beginning of the Cultural Revolution also triggered a wave of suicides. Many famous intellectuals ended their own lives at an early stage of the Cultural Revolution. The figures announced by the CCP for the Cultural Revolution were over 4.2 million people detained, over 1.7 million people died of unnatural causes. Over 135,000 people were labeled as counter-revolutionaries and executed. Over 237,000 people were killed, and over 7 million were disabled in armed attacks. And 71,200 families were destroyed. Statistics compiled from county annals show that 7 and 3 quarter million people died of unnatural causes during the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was the most frenzied leftist period in China. Killing became a competitive way to exhibit one's revolutionary standing, so the slaughter of class enemies was extremely cruel and brutal. The CCP mobilized mass campaigns inside and outside the party, starting to kill in the areas of literature, art, theater, history, and education. The CCP targeted the first attacks on several people. Later, the killing escalated from among all inside the party and army to all the people around the country. Armed fighting eliminated physical bodies. Cultural attacks killed people's spirit. It was an extremely chaotic and violent period. The evil side of human nature had been amplified to the maximum by the party's needs to revive its power in a crisis. Everyone could arbitrarily kill under the name of revolution and defending Chairman Mao's revolutionary line. The Cultural Revolution was an unprecedented nationwide exercise of eliminating human nature. Writer Zheng Yi described the cannibalism in Guangxi province during the Cultural Revolution. The beginning stage. The terror was covert and gloomy. At midnight, the killers tiptoed to find their victim and cut him open to remove his heart and liver. They ate the organs in silence. The peak stage. Veteran killers had gained experience in how to remove hearts and livers while the victim was still alive. The head killer was entitled to the heart, liver, and genitals, while others would take what was left. These dreadful scenes were adorned with flying flags and slogans. The mass frenzied stage. People were madly eating other people. Often, victims were first publicly criticized, which was always followed by killing and then cannibalism. As soon as a victim fell to the ground, people took out the knives they had prepared and surrounded the victim, cutting off any body part they could get hold of. 
and people enjoyed cannibalistic feasts. Do not mistakenly think that such a festival of cannibalism was purely an unorganized behavior of the people. The CCP was a totalitarian organization controlling every single cell of the society. Without the CCP's encouragement and manipulation, the cannibalism movement could not have happened at all. A song written by the CCP in praise of itself says, The old society turned humans into ghosts. The new society turned ghosts into humans. However, these killings and cannibalistic feasts tell us that the CCP could turn a human being into a monster or a devil because the CCP itself is crueler than any monster or devil. Family is the basic unit of the Chinese society. It is also the traditional culture's last defense against the party culture. That is why damage to the family is the cruelest in the CCP's history of killing. Because the CCP monopolizes all social resources, when a person is classified as being on the opposing side of the dictatorship, he or she will immediately face a crisis in livelihood, be accused by everyone in society, and stripped of his or her dignity. Because they are treated unjustly, the family is the only safe haven for these innocent people to be consoled. But the CCP policy of implication kept family members from comforting each other. Otherwise, they too risked being labeled opponents of the dictatorship. Family members' betrayal, reporting on, publicly criticizing or denouncing them, is the last straw that breaks their spirit. Many people have committed suicide as a result. In all previous political movements, over half of the Chinese population has been persecuted by the CCP and the number of families destroyed by the CCP is estimated to be over 100 million. One person died and the family was broken. Father and son, mother and daughter were forced to renounce their relationships. Some were disabled, some went crazy, and some died young because of serious illness brought about by torture. The record of all these family tragedies is very incomplete. Zhang Zhixin's daughter, Lin Lin, recalled that in the early spring of 1975, when she was in a so-called study session for the families of death row inmates, a person from Shenyang court said loudly, Your mother is a real die-hard counter-revolutionary. She is against our great leader, Chairman Mao. If she is executed, what will your attitude be? My heart was broken, but I pretended to be calm, trying hard to keep my tears from falling. My father told me that we could not cry in front of others, otherwise we had no way to renounce our relationship with my mother. Father answered for me, if this is the case, the government is free to do what it deems necessary. The person from court asked again, will you collect her body if she is executed, her belongings in prison? Father answered, we don't need anything. Staggering along, we walked home against the howling snowstorm. Father gently opened the suitcase we brought from our old home in Shenyang and took out our mother's photo. He looked at it and could not hold back his tears. I put my head into Father's arms and started crying loudly. Father patted me and said, Don't do that, sweetheart. We cannot let the neighbors hear it. Father held my brother and me tightly in his arms. We shed many tears that night, but we could not cry freely. The CCP, possessed by an evil specter, always uses terror as a means to maintain its rule. In different times, the terror displays in different forms. Therefore, killing is one of the methods the CCP uses to govern its terror-based regime. When people lack a strong sense of fear, the CCP could kill more to increase their sense of terror. When people are already fearful, killing a few could maintain the sense of terror. When people can't help but fear the CCP, then even just announcing the intention to kill would be enough for the CCP to maintain terror without actually having to kill. After having experienced countless political and killing movements, people have formed a conditioned reflex response to the CCP terror. Therefore, 
there is no need for the CCP to even mention killing. However, the CCP would adjust the intensity of its killing once people's sense of terror changes. The well-known saying of Deng Xiaoping then was, killing 200,000 people guarantees 20 years of stability. But the stability it talks about is that of the CCP rule, not for the Chinese people. As the people in China step into the era of computers and space travel and can talk privately about human rights, freedom, and democracy, many people think that the gruesome and disgusting atrocities are all in the past. The CCP has donned civilian clothing and is ready to connect with the world. However, the CCP lifted its knives once more when facing Falun Gong practitioners in 1999. As of the end of 2002, according to an internal source in mainland China, more than 7,000 Falun Gong practitioners have been tortured to death in detention centers, forced labor camps, prisons, or mental hospitals across China, averaging seven deaths per day. The over 100 cruel methods of torture exerted on Falun Gong practitioners concentrate all the aspects of devilry accumulated by the CCP. As China moves toward development, Chinese people have begun to live a good life. Nevertheless, the CCP wants to eliminate these common citizens. This kind of regression under the superficial face of progress and a persecution hidden behind a wall of lies that show the CCP nature of killing, even when not spilling blood, exposes its extreme devilry. During its long process of killing, the CCP has used various different ways to kill people depending on the period of time. The most often used ways include, number one, creating propaganda before killing, fabricating lies as the excuse for killing, and inciting hatred for those about to be killed. Number two, killing people not only through the machine of its dictatorship, but also by actively mobilizing people to kill each other. Three, destroying one's spirit before killing his physical body. Policies such as leniency to those who confess and severe punishment to those who resist force people to give up their own thoughts and beliefs. 4. Using both carrot and stick. The CCP always claims that the majority of the population is good, and it only attacks a small portion of the population. 5. Nipping potential threats in the bud and secretive extrajudicial killings. The CCP always arrests the so-called ringleaders and then draws up secret verbal regulations and orders. Six killing one to warn others. 7. Famous people with international influence are usually suppressed but not killed by the CCP. The purpose of this is to conceal the killing of those whose deaths will not draw public attention. In addition to killing people within China and inside the party with great delight, the CCP also participated in killing people abroad, including overseas Chinese people, by exporting the revolution. The Khmer Rouge is a typical example. Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge existed only for four years in Cambodia. Nevertheless, from 1975 through 1978, more than two million people, including over 200,000 Chinese, were killed. Pol Pot worshipped Mao Zedong. He visited China four times to listen to Mao Zedong's teachings in person. Theories such as, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, class struggle, dictatorship of the proletariat, and so on. Later, these became the basis for how he ruled Cambodia. After returning to Cambodia, Pol Pot changed the name of his party to the Cambodian Communist Party and established revolutionary bases according to the CCP's model of encircling cities from the countryside. The CCP spared no effort to support the Cambodian Communist Party. In 1970, when most Chinese people were going hungry, China gave Pol Pot arms for 30,000 soldiers. In 1975, after taking power for two months, Pol Pot went to Beijing to pay a visit and listen to instructions. Prince Sihanouk's two sons were killed by the Cambodian Communist Party 
and Pol Pot obediently sent Prince Sihanouk to Beijing on Zhao Enlai's orders. It was well known that when the Cambodian Communist Party killed people, they would even kill babies in their mother's wombs to prevent any possible troubles in the future. But at Zhao Enlai's request, Pol Pot obeyed without protest. With one word, Zhao Enlai saved Prince Sihanouk but the CCP did not object to the killing of more than 200,000 Chinese by the Cambodian Communist Party. At that time, the Chinese Cambodians went to the Chinese embassy for help, but the embassy ignored them. In May 1998, when the large-scale murder and rape of ethnic Chinese took place in Indonesia, the CCP did not say a word and even blocked the news inside China. It seems that the Chinese Communist government couldn't care less about the fate of overseas Chinese. It didn't even offer any humanitarian assistance. Stalin once said that the death of one man is a tragedy, but the death of one million is merely a statistic. Due to the CCP's information blockade, we have no way of knowing exactly how many people have died from the various movements of persecution that occurred during its rule. In addition, the CCP also killed ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, Yunnan, and other places. We have no way of knowing how many people became disabled, mentally ill, enraged, depressed, or frightened to death through the persecution they suffered. Every single death is a bitter tragedy that leaves everlasting agony to the family members of their victims. It must be pointed out that in the large-scale killings that took place previously, the identity, crime, and sentencing standard for its targets were kept intentionally vague by the CCP. To avoid being included as the targets for killing, people would often restrict themselves to a safe zone based on their own judgment. Such a safe zone was even narrower than the one the CCP intended to set. As a result, the movements were oftentimes enlarged beyond their intended scale because people at different levels voluntarily imposed restrictions on themselves to ensure their own safety. Such society-wide voluntary intensification of terror stems from the CCP's random killings. The mindset of fearing to tell the truth, to even fall below the bottom line of morality, and to be eager to please the CCP by following their evil direction. All of this has led Chinese people pay a very great price. Nowadays, the CCP tends to kill far fewer than in the past when millions or tens of millions would be murdered. There are two important reasons for this. On the one hand, the party has warped the minds of the Chinese people with its party culture so that now they are more submissive and cynical. On the other hand, because of excessive corruption and embezzlement by CCP officials, the Chinese economy has become a transfusion type of economy and depends substantially on foreign capital to sustain economic growth and social stability. The CCP vividly remembers the economic sanctions that followed the Tiananmen Square massacre and knows that open killing would result in a withdrawal of foreign capital that would endanger its totalitarian regime. Nevertheless, the CCP has never given up slaughtering behind the scenes. In its long history of killing, the CCP has metamorphosed into a depraved serial killer. In the meantime, it has been alienating Chinese people's souls. As a result, people learn to ignore others' lives and agonies and have become accustomed and numb to all kinds of inhuman atrocities, treating the lucky escape of atrocities to be the most rejoicing thing. In this way, by depending on brutal persecution, the CCP has been able to maintain its rule. Today, the compounded bloody debts of the CCP have made a benevolent solution impossible. It can only rely on intense pressure and totalitarian rule to maintain its existence until its final moment. The CCP's bloodthirsty nature has never changed. It will be even less likely to change in the future. Chi Yuan
山归正道，江山复清明。